but the actual patient has to do the work themselves. Force vital capacity again, how fast you get the air out. We're measuring the total volume you air you blow, but we're also measuring how much air you get out that very first second you start to blow, which is why it's important that you blow forcefully when you start to blow. Depending on the results of spirometry, the doctor's able to determine whether you have a pattern that's consistent with obstructive lung disease, and that would be asthma, emphysema, bronchitis, whether you have a restrictive disease, and you see that in things like sarcoidosis, uh, interstitial pulmonary fibrosis. Uh, we see a restrictive uh, pattern in pulmonary hypertension. And then there are going to be some people that are going to have a combination of obstructive and restrictive. And an example of that is an asthmatic, maybe they've been asthma, have asthma all their life, who later may develop sarcoidosis, which is a restrictive disease. And so they have what we call a combined pattern. You see a little of both in the pulmonary function test. We're going to start out today with a normal person, and this is... Uh, a 61-year-old uh, white female. You'll see their actual numbers are in the actual column, and then we have a column called predicted. And everybody is going to have a set of predicted values, and your predicted values, which are specific to you, are going to be based on a normal, well person, based on their age, their height, their sex, and their race. Now, as we age, everybody's pulmonary function is going to deteriorate a little bit. But usually it is not significant to the point that it causes people to have breathing troubles. Your height. Uh, taller people generally have bigger lungs than short people do. Sex. Men typically have a little bit bigger lungs than women do. And race. Of the races, Caucasians have the biggest lungs. And the reason that, uh, for that is most Caucasians carry their height through the trunk of their body. So they actually have bigger space to put lungs. Caucasians tend to be shorter through their legs. In the black race, uh, they're going to have a little bit smaller lungs than the white people. And their reason is that most of their height is through their legs. They tend to be a little shorter through the trunk of their body. And I think about the uh, NBA players, those tall black guys. If you look at them, you'll see most of, most of their height is really through their long legs. Asians and Hispanics typically are smaller built people, and they will have smaller lungs than Caucasians or blacks. This normal 61-year-old woman here, the total amount of air she blew out that very first second was 3.71 liters. That's what she actually was able to blow. Her predicted value was 3.25. So she's much better than she was predicted. She's actually 114%. And I'll tell you about this lady because this 61-year-old woman who's now 62 is me. Oh. When I was in my 30s, I actually blew out about 4.2 liters. I've actually lost about a half a liter of air over the last 30 years or so. But as you can see, it hadn't really affected my numbers. My predicted value will drop a little bit each year, but even losing a half a liter, you know, I'm not short of breath and I'm, I'm well above normal. The other number the doctor looks at very carefully is the volume of air you get out that very first second you blow. I actually blew out 2.9 liters of that total volume that very first second I started to blow. This is what was predicted, still at 115% of predicted. And the other valuable number we look at, it's going to compare the total amount of air that I blow out to the very first second that I started to blow. And that's this number here, this ratio. This is particularly important in the people with the obstructive lung diseases. <clears throat> I should be able, at 61 years old, to blow out 78% of all of my air the very first second I start to blow. I actually do blow out 78%, so I was 100% there. We don't, we don't, uh, actually, the American Thoracic Society, which sets the standards for pulmonary function 
now say that if you want to know if a person has obstructive disease, you look at this number first. If it's greater than 70, uh, 70, so it has to be 71 or better, they say you don't have obstructive lung disease. Uh, that has changed over the years back and forth. We'll see a little bit more about that later when we look at a patient with obstructive lung disease. This is a normal person, like I said. This is what's called a flow volume loop. And what it is is a graphic picture of me. First of all, I sucked in a big breath and I blow real hard. This is what we call the peak flow. Some of you have peak flow meters at the asthmatics do. They check their peak flow. That's the maximum force that I was able to exert. I blow out, blow out, blow out, blow out, blow out. I get down to empty and then I pull back in a breath. This picture is particularly uh, valuable to ear, nose, and throat doctors. Uh, pulmonary doctors usually look at them. Family doctors, not so much. Uh, dependent, if you have a, a, a tumor in your throat, if you have a voider uh, on your thyroid that's causing pressure against your trachea, this picture can change drastically. Not so much the numbers, but the picture does. And ear, nose, and throat, and pulmonary doctors can pretty much figure out from the picture where the obstruction is. So we, we anytime you have spirometry, you also have that flow volume loop. That's spirometry. Now we're gonna go to lung volumes. Uh, we know that no matter how hard you blow, how forcefully you blow on spirometry, there is always some air left in your lungs. You can't, you can't get it out. If you could actually force all the air out of your lungs, your lungs would collapse like a little accordion, and that would not be a good scenario. So, we have to have some way to measure the amount of air that's left in your lungs. And this is the test where the technician closes the door to that box. The boxes today are plexiglass so that the patient can see out of the box. Many years ago, the, when I first came on the scene, that box was, a, a, was completely metal except for a little hole right in the front that the patient could peep out of. And it had a huge, uh, the, the door had a big wheel on it like you see on ships and you close the door, and then you took that big wheel and you turned it, and there was no way for that person to get out of that little uh, metal box. Today, the plexiglass, and we don't really tell patients this, but there is a little button on the side that you can push if you're claustrophobic, you can open it. Most patients are able to tolerate uh, the plexiglass box. You only have to be in there for two or three minutes. There are other uh, ways to measure uh, lung volumes. Uh, most people today go to this box where it's closed because you can do it very quickly in two or three minutes. And some of the other tests involve uh, maybe 15, 20, 30 minutes to do. So uh, most people have fallen to these. Um, and none of these methods are harmful to the patient. Again, uh, and this is called polythmography because you're in the, the box called a polythmograph. You sit very quietly, the door is closed, you wait about a minute just so that the patient's body temperature and the temperature inside of the box equilibrates. Then the technician, you're going to have a little nose clip on and a little mouthpiece in your mouth and the technician is going to ask you to take your hands and gently press against your cheeks. You're going to breathe along nice and easy for a couple normal breaths and then the technician is going to ask you to pant and it's a gentle pant uh, you pant for two or three breaths the shutter is closed and suddenly the shutter opens up it does give you this for just a second you know there is no air there when the shutter is closed and you're panting against that closed shutter it's a little scary but most patients are able to tolerate that this, I'm not going to go into why this works. Uh, for those of you who, who uh, this is called, this is Boyle's, one of Boyle's gas laws. Uh, we're measuring pressure changes. Um, 
the volume one, which is the volume in the box times the pressure one, which is the pressure inside the box is equal to the volume two, which is the patient's volume in his lungs, um, times the pressure, and that's measured at the mouth, which is why that shutter closes. Uh, I will tell you it all works very nicely. 